Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Thomas, a member of the Executive Committee of the Cornell Academics and Professors Emeriti. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Cornell Connects, and I'm personally looking forward to this. I think it's just a very exciting uh, webinar, uh, Zoom meeting, photograph collections at Cornell. Speaker, you've sort of met Kate Edelman Frankel is the Gary and Ellen Davis Curator of Photography. Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art. She earned a BA from Concordia and MA in Photographic Preservation from Ryerson University in Toronto and a PhD in Art History from the University of Toronto. Prior to coming co to Cornell, she held curatorial positions uh, with a few uh, places you may have heard of, the National Gallery of Arts, the Musée d'Orsay and the Rijksmuseum. Katie joined Cornell in 2017 as curator of photography for the Johnson Museum and in the library's division of rare and manuscript collections. The dual role came about through a grant from the Mellon Foundation, and she is gonna share what she has learned about campus photographs and the resources for related research at Cornell. We will put questions at the end, so we're sure that Katie gets through her presentations and uh, we'll uh, call on you to ask those uh, at the time, or if you prefer, you can put them in the chat function as you go along. So Katie, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for this invitation to be here. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for joining us on this incredible fall day. Um, I will begin my screen sharing here so we can look at some images together. There we go. So if all looks good, I'll get started. Um, as Joe mentioned, I, I came to Cornell about four years ago. Um, and I, I came as the curator for the rare and manuscript collections in the library and for the Johnson Museum of Art, um, the photography curator. Um, this is part of a, a Mellon grant. Um, and that grant is now wrapping up. So because we're sort of entered a new phase, I'm now curator solely for the Johnson Museum. Um, so my dual appointment has ended at this point, but just a few months ago. But in the previous three and a half years, I had a lot of time to get to know the photography collections in the library as well as in the museum. So what I wanna to do today is just share with you some of what I've learned about the photographs and photo collections that are held across these repositories at Cornell and then talk a bit about how I've approached the job of curating across collections. Um, and I wanna start just by uh, talking really briefly about some of the differences between uh, museum and library photography collections. And what I'm showing you on the screen here are images of, um, of repositories, uh, of these two different kinds of repositories, just to give you a sense of how the storage practices differ, which might give you a sense of how the collecting practices differ too. Um, I should mention that these are not images of Cornell's storage spaces. These are actually images of MoMA's storage spaces in New York City, which is what I happened to find online. Um, but our own storage spaces don't look totally unlike these. Um, so one thing that you might notice is that in the image on the right, which is an image from um, MoMA's archive, um, you can see that there's just a lot more material concentrated there. Um, libraries tend to acquire in bulk. So when we talk about library collections, we're really talking about um, large volumes of material. They think in terms of collections and archives rather than in terms of individual objects. Um, whereas museums, and I hope the image at the left gives you a sense of this, think about photographs and other museum objects as individual objects. They're all individually cataloged, um, stored individually. Um, and this is one major difference between um, these two kinds of repositories. Another, which is related, is that um, museum uh, libraries and archives tend to think about um, their holdings as records, as documents, as information. Um, whereas museums, of course, think about their holdings as work of art, as works of art. Um, but photographs are one of the objects that are held across these two different kinds of repositories, even though they can be thought of and stored very differently. So I'll move on now um, to talk about some of the photographs that are held um, at Cornell, beginning with the Johnson Museum. 
Um, so the first part of my job on arriving at Cornell was to investigate these collections. Um, and when I talk about the library, um, I just want to make it clear that I'm talking about mostly about the Rare and Manuscript Division or RMC and Croc Library, um, but also about materials held in Croc Asia. There are a number of photographic materials there, um, as well as in the Kiel Center at the Catherwood Library in the ILR School, which has um, a tremendous wealth of photographic materials as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of work is held in each repository and what kind of work we've targeted for acquisition for each repository. So probably unsurprisingly, uh, in the museum, we have photographs that were created by artists and photographs that were created as works of art from the earliest days of the medium until now. And what I'm showing you here are two very early examples from our collection. On the left is a salted paper print by David Octavius Hill and Robert Adamson, known as the duo Hill and Adamson. This is from 1845. And on the right is a photograph by the French photographer, Edward Balduce, the premier architectural photographer of his generation. Um, this is a photograph of one of the pavilions of the Louvre from 1852. Um, David Octavius Hill was a painter and he worked with Robert Adamson to create photographs that he used as models for his own paintings. So the duo do seem to have been interested in the possibilities of photography as, uh, as art as well um, at this very early stage. Um, but they really were primarily creating images that Hill could use as models for his paintings. And this is one of the primary ways that photography was used uh, even in its infancy. Um, whereas Balduce was creating um, was creating photographs, we we can say as an artist, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, but the way that people were writing about it at the time, it certainly does seem that he was creating um, photographs that were seen as works of art. And then here are some more examples. We're just kind of moving through chronologically more examples of what we would consider art photography from the museum's collection. Um, on the left is a photograph by Edward Steichen from 1901. This is a portrait that was published in Camera Work, a very important journal uh, edited by Edward Steichen at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and the Johnson Museum's collection is strong in this kind of work. And when I say this kind of work, I mean work associated with the pictorialist movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, the pictorialist movement was concerned with Kind of laying a groundwork for, or laying um, laying out some ground rules for what art photography should be, um, and it's generally thought of as the first international art movement for photography that existed. Uh, and the Johnson Museum has some very nice examples from from the, this uh, era by these pictorialist photographers who worked in a very painterly mode. Uh, were very interested in the work that was being made by artists working in other media at the time and adopting some of those modes for photography. Um, on the right is an abstract photograph by a Japanese photographer named Osamu Shihara from the 1930s. This is a new acquisition for us. Um, the museum is not so strong in work from this period that demonstrates how photography manifests within various movements of modernism. Um, so this is one area that we are trying to build. It's difficult because a lot of people like this work and want this work. Um, so it's very, um, it's very valuable. Um, but there are certainly still some wonderful works out there that, um, that we're trying to bring into our collection. And then moving forward again, um, we have some excellent examples in the museum of photographic, um, of photographic work, artwork from the late 20th and current century, when photography is a huge part of the contemporary art world and when most major artists working with photography consider themselves to be exactly that, artists working with photography rather than as photographers. Um, and what you're seeing on the left is um, a work by Lorna Simpson from 1991. And on the right, a new acquisition by Wendy Redstar from 2011. And I just want to mention that these are both, that the scale of these, of these two works is both very large. Of course, that's something that in these online presentations gets completely lost. Everything looks like it's the same size, um, but I assure you that it's not. <laughs> And then 
the museum also has many photographs that were created for purposes other than art. Um, so this can include commercial work, uh, photographs made for personal use, photographs that were created as part of scientific experiment, for instance, in the early days of photography. So at the Johnson, we have examples of photography's multitude of uses from all periods of the medium's history um, back to the 1840s. Um, so these are works that may not have been intended as art, but maybe you'll agree with me from looking at these images that they are more or less indistinguishable from works of art, at least visually speaking. Um, and certainly works like this have been and continue to be subjected to art historical analysis. So these kinds of photographs, photographs that were not um, made as works of art, um, but that we might consider works of art now, they are in the minority in the museum, but there are still thousands of them. Um, and I should mention that the Johnson Museum contain, the Johnson Museum Photography Collection probably contains about 8,000 photographic objects. Um, so it's a sizable collection, but still um, quite small compared to the library's collection, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and just to let you know what we're looking at on the screen here, on the left is a photograph by um, great Japanese studio photographer Kusakabe Kimbe um, from the second half of the 19th century with this amazing um, uh, hand painting that you see in work from his studio and many other Japanese studios of the period. Um, in the middle is a Polaroid that's actually Diane von Fristenberg, the designer that was made by Andy Warhol. The museum has a nice collection of um, Warhol Polaroids. He loved making Polaroids um, and took pictures of his friends at, at parties and when they would just come by. Um, and we have these kind of compiled into an album um, with a number of other um, personal photographs of Warhol. So not things that he would have exhibited um, in his lifetime or that were necessarily part of his artistic practice. And on the right is another new acquisition that's acquired in 2020. This is a very special object. Um, this is a photoglyphic engraving by William Henry Fox Talbot, who was one of the inventors of photography um, and also one of the inventors of photoglyphic engraving, which is a photomechanical reproduction process or a means of recreating chemical photographs in ink um, in order to make them um, reproducible and to make them more stable. So he was at the forefront of experiments in this incredibly important technology. Um, and this is a, a really nice example of his work in that process from the early days and also expresses something about his, um, his lifelong interest in botany. So we're going to move to the library now. Um, and what you're seeing here are all examples from um, the Rain Manuscript Collections in Croc Library. Um, so the first thing to know about the library, as I've mentioned already, is that the collection of photographs there is many, many, many times larger. Um, so for a curator, learning about the collection is not as simple as it is in the Johnson Museum, where um, two perfectly sound approaches might be just opening boxes or browsing the database. This is not going to work in the library. You can't um, go into the vaults in RMC and just open boxes. Um, it, the collection is just far too vast. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know that the RMC vault is under the art squad and it's about the size of a football field. And of course there are many things in there that are not photographic, but there are a lot of things that are photographic in there too. Um, we estimate that there are about a million photographs just in the university archives. So in the university archives alone, which is only one of RMC's many collections, um, there, there are likely at least a million photographs. You can imagine how many there are in the collections in total. Um, another reason why it's a little bit more complicated to learn what the library has is because photographs there don't form a discrete collection the way they do in the Johnson. So at the Johnson, we have a, you know, a discrete photography collection, a photography department. Um, whereas in the library in RMC, um, photographs are integrated everywhere. They're scattered throughout the collections. They're found in all parts of the RMC collection. Um, um, so they're integrated into institutional archives, business archives, artist archives. Uh, they're in books. Um, they're in books both as photomechanical reproductions and as original chemical prints from the time before photomechanical production, re reproduction was really viable. Um, and they're also in people's personal papers. 
So what we're looking at here, just to show you some examples, um, are a photograph at the top left of Ethel Waters. This is from the Amsterdam News Archive. The Amsterdam News was one of the most important African-American newspapers in the United States for a long time. It was published in, in Harlem uh, on Amsterdam Avenue, hence the name. And we have in RMC what we call the photo morgue of the Amsterdam News. So this is the, the photo archive. So it contains photographs that were used in the publication. And that's why you can see these marks around her face, because these would have been the, the, the crop marks indicating to um, the people who were going to make reproductions from this for the newspaper what part of the photograph they wanted to be reproduced. Um, and then underneath Ms. Waters, we have a self-portrait by Joe Conzo. Um, we have the Joe Conzo archive in RMC. Conzo was a teenage photographer in the Bronx in the 1970s who um, was very interested in hip hop in its earliest days and had a lot of friends who were in that scene, um, artists, musicians, dancers, and with his camera, he recorded, um, you know, some of the earliest concerts, parties that were that were taking place there as part of this, you know, nascent, um, nascent art form of hip hop. Um, and that archive is almost entirely negatives, but amazingly, they have all been scanned. Um, so you can see digital images of them um, as positives through um, the Cornell Library's portal. Um, in the middle is a plate from a fabulous lunar atlas from the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, published over a period of decades um, called the Atlas Photographique de la Lune. Um, and what you're looking at is one of many beautiful, very large scale photogravures um, showing the surface of the moon. Um, these are images that were taken at the observatory in Paris. So this is a volume that was collected by Cornell as it was being published um, for its astronomical interest significance. Um, and on the right is an image from, um, from an album that we have cataloged as the Michigan Lesbian Snapshot album from the 1930s. Um, and this is an album that uh, contains the personal photographs of these two women partners um, who lived together in the 1930s. Um, and this is part of the human sexuality collection. So we have a number of these um, family albums, personal albums in the human sexuality collection, um, in the Cornell University archives um, and in and other collections throughout the library. And they can be really fascinating and contain some really moving poignant images like this one. So also in the library, um, we have some photographs by famous artists. So um, things that we might think to look for in the museum rather than in the library. Um, but because they relate to the history of publishing, they were acquired for the library, of course, because the library is a place that is interested in books. Um, so on the left, we have an image from a very famous work by a French photographer named Versailles called Paris de Nuit, Paris by Night, that was, um, published in the 1930s, or no, late 1920s, I think. Um, a really beautiful book of rotogravures of Paris at night that Versailles is still best known for, even though he had a long career after that. Um, and on the right is an image from the archive that we have in RMC of photographs by Larry Clark, um, who is a very well-known kind of infamous American photographer um, of the late 20th century. And this work I think is from his series Tulsa, which was the first, um, the first photo book that he published from the 1970s. Um, and these are both things that absolutely would not be out of place in the museum. Um, but again, because of their relationship to publishing, they were acquired for the library. And here are some more examples of photographs from archival collections in the library. Um, so these archival collections can be largely photographic, they can be uh, entirely photographic, or they can contain only a few photographs. Sometimes an archive might contain mostly correspondence, personal papers, business records, 
um, other textual material, and then a handful of photographs as well. Um, and what I'm showing on the left is an example from an archive like that. This is from the um, um, John Melmoth Dow papers. Uh, Dow was a 19th century shipping agent and naturalist, and Cornell has his papers. Um, and within those papers are photographs by, um, by a photographer named Fitzgibbon, who worked in Guatemala in the 1850s. Um, very, so these are very early photographs, salted paper prints of Guatemala. It's quite an exceptional um, collection of photographs. There, it's a very small collection. There were only a few of them, um, but these are some of the earliest photographs of, of Guatemala that we have. Um, and these are part of, um, part of a collection that is not um, really about that. They just happen to be in there because Dow collected them on his travels. Um, and on the right is an example of a photograph from an archive that is entirely photographic. This is the US President's Railroad Commission photographs collection held um, at the Keele Center in Catherwood Library. A really interesting collection of photographs that were made um, as, part of, um, as part of proof in a labor dispute um, between railroad companies and, um, and the employees and, and the railroad union. Um, and there are these amazing, so, you know, a lot of the photographs in this, in that archive are quite dry, a lot of photographs of trains and train tracks. Um, but then there are also these remarkable visual surprises throughout the archive. So some really um, visually striking, just wonderful images, but that were collected, of course, for their historical interest, their interest to the history of labor and not for their aesthetic interest. So Katie, uh, before you go on, uh, sure. there was one question, Lisa Earl. Lisa, do you have a question? I do not. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. My screen said that uh, you raised your hand. Sorry, I was just, Katie? Just, just testing the icon. Okay, good, thank you. Sorry. Not a problem. All right. Katie, back to you. All right, thanks. Um, so here's just another example. This is um, also from the also from the Keel Center. This is also another great small collection. Um, this is a pair of photographs by Frank and Lillian Gilbreth from 1915. Um, the Gilbreths were um, interested in the link between movement and productivity. And they used photography as part of their research into the connection between these two things. And they devised a way of recording movement in photographs, which was to um, attach uh, lights to um, the bodies and the hands of, um, of subjects in the studio and then have them move in a certain way uh, with these long exposures. And then they could trace the patterns of the light. Um, and this would tell them something about how people moved and how that related to how efficient they were going to be at work, um, which is why these are held by the Keel Center. But these are also another example of photographs that although not made as works of art have become very interesting to art museums um, in recent years. Um, they just seem very experimental and avant-garde and visually interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, a big part of um, the work of discovering what photographs and photographic objects we hold in the library has been attribution. There are, I'm, I'm sure, still many, many groups of photographs that have not been attributed to a photographer. Um, and because of this, it's a little bit trickier to find them. It's always easier to find photographs in the library catalog when you can search by maker. Um, so in the course of my work, I've been able to um, attribute um, several groups of photographs. Um, and so we've been able to attach names of photographers to these collections and hopefully they will be more easily discoverable by students, by researchers now. And it's also just great to learn that we have work by some of these photographers um, who were not represented in the Johnson Museum's collection. So it's good to know that their work is represented on campus. Um, and what I'm showing you here are three examples from Croc Asia's collections. Uh, on the left is a photograph by John Thompson, in the middle by Felix Beato, and on the right by William Saunders. Um, these are all part of, um, of Croc Asia's holdings, as I think I just mentioned. 
um, and these all date to around 1865. This is another um, album that, um, that I attributed recently. This is by a Chinese photographer named Lai Feng. Um, it's an album of photographs of Beijing that he made around 1879. And as such, they're some of the earliest photographs of Beijing that exist anywhere, these images. So this is um, a very important album that Cornell holds. And this was featured in an exhibition that I did on Lai Feng in 2020, just at the very beginning of 2020, just before the shutdown. And one more example of this kind of attribution, this was an early discovery. Um, I still uh, am just so thrilled about this one um, because these have always been some personal favorite photographs of mine. Um, these are by a photographer named Adrien Tournachon, who was an important photographer in Paris in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and these were collected by a veterinarian at some point and donated to the vet school and then later transferred to RMC where they were cataloged just as photographs from the Paris Agricultural Fair of 1856. Um, and so by att attributing them to Tournachon, now we're hoping that people who are not only interested in cows and agriculture, but also interested in the history of photography and Tournachon's role will be able to find them and use them in their research as well. So I'm going to move now to talking about um, bridging the divide between these two repositories, the museum and the library, um, and curating across them, which has been an important aspect of my work. So one strategy has been identifying materials across units that are complementary or even overlapping. Um, and this is important for um, developing research and exhibition projects, both my own and those of our students and researchers. Um, and what I'm showing you here are examples of, um, uh, of work by photographers, um, sorry, of, uh, I'm showing you works by photographers who are represented in both collections. Um, so on the left is an image by William Stillman, um, an early and wonderful archaeological photographer who made this fabulous volume on the Acropolis, which exists in its entirety in RMC. And in the Johnson Museum, we have one plate from this publication. So there is that overlap there. In the middle is a photograph by Edward Curtis. Um, we probably have 20 photographs by um, photogravures by Edward Curtis in the Johnson Museum. Um, and in RMC, we have all 20 volumes of his opus, The North American Indian, um, along with some uh, test proofs for that publication, test photogravures, and some um, glass plate positives, interpositives that were used in the creation of the photogravures. So some overlap there as well, but a much more um, robust collection in the library. Um, same thing with um, um, same thing with um, Ed Ruche at the bottom. Um, we have uh, some repetition there in that 26 gasoline stations. And I think some other books are held in both the library and in the museum. And then there are um, many more that are held um, just in the library. Um, and at the top there, um, Moybridge's Animal Locomotion, a play from Animal Locomotion, we have again, probably about 15 of these in the Johnson Museum. And in the library, we have hundreds hundreds and hundreds that were acquired at the time that Moybridge's publisher was making them available and they were acquired for their scientific interest by the library. Um, so it's really important to understand the full extent of campus holdings of work by a given artist or photographer, of course, for any projects that we might want to develop around them. So that's been one important aspect of my, of my work. Um, and then I've also been, apart from work by the same photographers or even the same exact works, um, I've also been interested in finding complementary works that exist across the museum and the library. Um, so when I say complementary materials, I mean work that uh, was made for similar purposes in similar ways or that deals with the same themes. For instance, botany, uh, photography's application to botany in the 19th century. Um, so on the left here, we have an example by Anna Atkins from 1851 from the Johnson's collection, cyanotype, and on the right, a cyanotype by Liberty Hyde Bailey, 
um, and the muse the library has has Bailey's archive, um, and that includes hundreds of these really beautiful cyanotypes that he made of various plant specimens and other things. Here are some more complementary materials, this time related to, for instance, uh, the history of uh, photography's relationship with celebrity um, and the use of photography in developing celebrity image. Um, these are both photographs of Alexandre Dumas. Um, the one on the left is held by the Johnson Museum. It's by the great portrait photographer Nadar, um, active in France in the, from the middle to the end of the 19th century. And on the right, is a, a much smaller, so these are at completely different scales, these two things, a much smaller carte visite, um, so a small um, portrait card photograph mass produced um, of the same subject by an unknown photographer. Um, and I should say that another reason why it's important to locate complementary materials and um, work by the same photographers in both repositories is apart from research and exhibition development, it's also teaching. Um, because materials don't move very easily between these two repositories, the museum and the library, because they're at opposite ends of the art squad. Ithaca has inclement weather a lot of the time. We're not carrying these things back and forth outside. Um, so the materials really for teachings tend to stay in the repositories where they are. So it's important to find these complementary materials so that we can teach classes on similar themes in these two different uh, units of the university. Uh, here's another example of um, some materials that we can think of as complementing each other, even though they're very different. Um, on the left is a large contemporary photograph by Yasu Masamori Mura, um, a self-portrait as Liza Minnelli from Cabaret from 1996, a very large, a very large piece. Um, and on the right from a really fabulous um, collection in the Human Sexuality Collection in RMC of um, male and female impersonator postcards from Europe from the early part of the 20th century um, is a photograph of um, a performer named Jean Bloch. Um, and here she is outfitted as the president of France, Gaston Fallière, and this is from about 1910. Um, so we can think of these as complementary in that they relate to the history of photography and gender performance, or even the history of uh, photography and uh, expression of queer identity. Uh, it's also been important to identify work by photographers that are associated with one another. So on the left here is a photograph by Anthony Barboza and from about 1970 on Coney Island. And on the right is a photograph by Herbert Randall from about 1970, probably taken in Harlem, both from New York City. Um, and the one on the right is held in the Johnson, part of an artist portfolio, uh, a multi-artist portfolio from the 1970s. And the one on the left is part of a huge collection of photographs by Barboza. There are thousands of photographs by him in RMC. Um, so these two photographers are divided uh, across the museum and the library, but they were um, peers they both belong to the Kamange workshop of African-American photographers that was founded in the, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, some of you might be um, familiar with this group. They made incredible work and there was just um, a wonderful exhibition about the workshop uh, that was developed by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and then traveled to the Whitney Museum in New York earlier this year. Um, and it's also been very interesting to identify across repositories materials that are directly related. Um, so what I'm showing you here on the right is a photograph by um, Robert Kappa, a photographic print by Robert Kappa from the Life Archive um, from 1943 um, that's held by the Johnson. And on the left, I'm showing you a spread from Life magazine from the 30th of August, 1943, where you can see the same photograph reproduced in the lower left. So the library, not RMC, but just um, Olin Library, I think it's Olin in general circulation, um, has bound copies of uh, every issue of Life Magazine. 
and the Johnson Museum has a sizable collection of photojournalistic prints that were created by life photographers for publication in the magazine. Um, so it's entirely possible to match these things up um, using the resources that exist in both locations and learn something about um, how the photographs were designed on the page, uh, which ones were chosen for publication, and something about their circulation, their circulation and presentation histories. So how do we bring these photographs together once we know that these complementary or related materials or overlapping materials exist in these two repositories? How do we actually, you know, what, what work can we do to bring them together? Um, one way of doing this has been through exhibitions that take a holistic view of Cornell's collections, whose arguments are conceived by looking across repositories at collecting history um, and collection materials of the whole university. Um, so I have tried to do this in a couple of exhibitions, particularly those that I've done as part of the grant that brought me to Cornell in the first place. Um, this was the first exhibition that I did. This is an installation view from the first exhibition that I did um, in the fall of 2018 at the Johnson Museum. Um, uh, that was about the history of photographic collections at Cornell, and it brought together these materials um, I brought together a number of materials from the museum and the library to tell a story about um, history of photography, yes, but more importantly and specifically the history of photography at the university, um, which was very interesting to learn about. And actually um, the, uh, the series of four photographs that's hanging in the frame on the right there, at the top right, you can see um, the picture of, um, of the, uh, President Fallier impersonator that I just showed um, a couple slides ago. So I guess that's a favorite. Uh, and this is another exhibition that I did. Um, this was in the fall of 2019. Um, this was an exhibition called World Picture that used materials from both the museum and the library to examine the place of photography within the larger history of travel imagery. Um, and part of this project also has been to do these exhibitions at the museum and at the library. So the, the image that I just showed before was, um, uh, was of an exhibition that took place in the museum. And this is an exhibition that took place in um, RMC's Hirschland Gallery. Um, another way of, um, of kind of uniting these collections has been to create what we have called teaching sets of photographs um, on themes, on five broad themes. Um, and these teaching sets incorporate materials from both locations. Um, they exist currently only as Excel spreadsheets that have been um, circulated to faculty at Cornell that we know are interested in teaching with photographs. Um, but we are in the, uh, in the process of digitizing them all and making them available through the library's digital collections portal as these discrete sets. Um, so this will be one area of the portal where you can actually browse um, materials that um, are held by the museum. Um, so we're bringing together museum and library collections in this digital space. Um, and finally, one recent kind of COVID era initiative has been launching an Instagram account um, for Cornell's uh, photography collections. So if you are on Instagram, I hope you will follow us. Um, we're Cornell Photo Project. Um, and my wonderful interns and I um, post these uh, images from our collections to Instagram. We try to do it about once a week. Um, just with a short caption saying something about uh, the photograph and the collection that it comes from, just to give people an idea of really the cross section of materials that exists at Cornell. Um, and again, to bring the materials from the collections together in a digital space, since we can't do that very often in a physical space. Um, so I think I have spoken for just about long enough and I'm happy to take some questions if there are some and I can stop my share here. So ladies and gentlemen, um, do you have uh, questions? Anne. 
Katie, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I loved seeing the um, Liberty High Bailey cyanotypes. I never tire of seeing those. Uh, that you may or may not know they were the only items from Cornell chosen by John Sarnowski for his famous photography until now exhibit in uh, MoMA. I think it was 1990. Um, my question to you is, uh, are either of the uh, repositories venturing into collecting digital photography? Um, you mean um, uh, dematerialized <laughs> photography, photography that exists only online? Well, or, or is created um, uh, via digital photography versus uh, right. light lens. Right. So both are actually true. Um, in the in the library, there is definitely a push to, um, well, there are many collections of materials that are only digital. Um, so the library actually, you know, I'm not really sure how this works. Um, Trey Burney would be the person to talk to about this, but I know that there are collections that are purely digital um, that are accessible through the Cornell uh, Library's digital collections portal. Um, but yes, as far as photographs that were born digital and then became material, were printed in some way, yes, certainly the museum and the library um, does collect materials like that. But are you collecting the, the digital uh, files themselves for digital? Oh, that's what you mean. No, um, I don't know. I don't know if the library is. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been involved with any acquisitions like that. Mm -hmm. The museum has not ventured into that territory yet. Um, and it will be interesting to, you know, it, I'm sure it is just a matter of time. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that plays out. But so far, no. So, uh, Katie, you talked a lot about all of the many things that are at Cornell, and I suspect uh, there's a lot more that you haven't seen because you've only been here for four years. Um, but can you talk for a minute about how you're trying to build the collection? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, my time as the photo curator in uh, RMC has come to an end, as I mentioned. So I'm no longer um, very involved with um, collections building strategy over there. Um, but one thing that I did do in my time there was... Um, um, was try to acquire more photo books, um, particularly because there are faculty members in the art history department who are interested in photo book as a form. Um, and I'm actually teaching a course this semester with Professor Andrew Moisey on the photo book and our students at the end of the course will um, create an exhibition that will ultimately be mounted in the museum. Um, so I've been working on building, on building that collection there. Um, and in the museum, um, in the museum, there are a number of ways in which we are aiming to build the collection. Um, we certainly have gaps that deserve to be filled, um, but you know, one can't just go around filling gaps forever because there will always be areas that um, that are just not well represented. It's just the way that it is. Um, but a couple of areas that we have seen as very important are um, works by global artists. Um, and this is because the museum, the Johnson Museum has a global collection, but the photography collection has been very American um, and some European, very Western and very American. And to me, because the museum, the, the collection of the larger museum is not focused in that way, it doesn't make sense for the photography collection to be focused in that way. So I've been working on expanding kind of um, the borders of the collection to incorporate many more, um, many more geographic artists by um, artists from many more places. Um, and there's also the important issue of representation of women artists, artists of color. Um, the collection has skewed very white, very male, as have many museum collections. And this is also something that deserves uh, immediate attention. Um, so those are two areas that I've been um, working on specifically. And then I'll just mention one more because I'm actually a 19th century specialist. Um, and the museum's collection it has not been strong on 19th century work. And I felt that it was important to um, have a basis of early work for teaching on the history of photography. Um, I've been working on, um, on bolstering that area of the collection as well. Thank you very oh. much. 
Frank uh, Robinson has a question. Hi, Frank. Hey, hi, Katie. Great talk. <laughs> You've given, given a wonderful feeling for it, for, for it all. Are you, Thank can you. you still, uh, it's really marvelous. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, uh, advice to beginning collectors. H how would you advise somebody uh, to start off? Uh, collecting, becoming a collector of of photography uh, in these days. I think you would be a great person to answer that question, Frank. You have such a no, wonderful no. collection yourself, and have given so many wonderful things to the museum, even in the time that I've been there. Um, so I would be curious to know your thoughts, but I, I guess I could say that um, you know it really it depends so much on budget. Um, the photography market has absolutely exploded, as I'm sure you know, since the 1990s. Um, so it's no longer possible for a lot of people to acquire work by um, photographers whose work would have been very possible to acquire, you know, only 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, so assuming that there are budget constraints, um, I think that um, some great places for people to start looking, especially if you're interested in vernacular photography, um, which I, I think collectors who are just starting off, that would be a, a, you know, a good area to consider, um, are the online vendors. eBay um, is an incredible place to find some really striking, wonderful images from, you know, from um, the middle of the 19th century until now. I found some wonderful things there. Um, and then for contemporary work, I'd say graduate student shows. I mean, our own graduate students here at Cornell produce some amazing things. Um, fine art students at universities around the country, they will often have, um, often have shows. And even if they are not selling directly from those exhibitions, it's a great way of learning about emerging artists whose work would still be accessible. Um, but if you're interested in, um, you know, the big splashy contemporary pieces, um, especially by artists who are quite well known at this point, um, then, you know, you really want to make the gallerists your friends, find gallerists that you trust, um, go to the fairs, learn about what's available. Um, but you will need to be prepared to part with uh, <laughs> the money. <laughs> right. Would you add anything, Frank? I'm interested to know. No, I think that's, ter that, that's terrific. I mean, it, uh, uh, it, it takes a lot of work, but it's the most fun uh, part of museum work. It's really what what where you can be creative and make a contribution to your own museum or to your own collection, which ultimately, of course, you want to give to a to to a great museum like the Johnson. <laughs> thank you, Frank. Thank thank you, Frank. Uh, Jim Lasoy has a question. Hi, Katie. That uh, that was a great presentation. It was very very interesting. I'm. I'm sp uh, particularly interested in documentary uh, photography around landscapes, nature, and rural indigenous uh, communities and people. And one of the things I, I've noticed is if, you know, and you said you, you focused on the late 19th century, is a lot of the, many of the photographs in that, in that arena um, were taken as documentary photographs and now through a different set, new eyes of, Today they move into the more into the fine art and art collections. And mm -hmm. uh, when the initial intent was to document nature, local people, or landscape, so what what criteria are used in a in a contemporary sense to look back on these uh, photos and what you know what will happen with the collections that were were made in the. 1970s, 100 years from now? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. You mean photographs that, um, photographs that were made in a documentary vein in the 1970s? Well, well I can be very specific. I, I'm fortunate to have had a friend, uh, Anne LaBastille, who was a woods woman who was, who was quite famous in the in, uh, conservationist here in New York. And I have her slide collections from uh, her work in the Amazon, uh, which mm. were all, which was all done in the seventies. And mm. they were done for documentary purposes and to illustrate their various books. And so mm. I'm wondering when, and some of them are quite striking, but yep, they're, uh, you know, they, they weren't really done in the fine arts 
uh, variety. So what what will happen with Anne's collection when it's now a hundred years old and people are looking at those chromes with a different with with a, a whole different uh, set of eyes and 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 situation and what should be done with those? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I have never I have never thought about I've never thought about that before. Um, because you're absolutely right, photographs that were made in the 19th century for documentary purposes, um, then 100 years later, uh, you know, are looked at with completely new eyes and are acquired by, by art museums. Um, and that question of art and documentary uh, becomes very tricky. And to some curators, especially in the, in the 19th century, it was not an important question. Uh, there were some curators that were not concerned with the intent of the photographer um, who were content to, you know, um, uh, do a formalist analysis of the photographs and decide that they were, decide that they were art and collect them for art museums. And then there were people who really pushed back against that, scholars and other curators that pushed back against that and said that, um, you know, this is uh, completely taking these objects out of context um, it's, you know, it's um, denying them of their original meaning, and it doesn't make sense um, to be analyzing them this way and for, to, be, to be considering them as part of the history of art. Um, but I have never thought about what could happen 100 years later. So I'm, I would be curious to know if, um, you know, if curators will have learned their lesson by then from what happened earlier. Um, or if we will have moved completely beyond that question and it will just be irrelevant at that point. Um, and maybe the way that photographs can circulate so easily these days online means that it won't matter too much which repository they actually end up in because it will always be being viewed out of context um, um, and in a way that is completely different from how they were originally viewed. Um, when they're being viewed in a dematerialized kind of way. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's certainly interesting to think about. Um, but, you know, as I, as I was talking about in my presentation, or as I, you know, hope was, hope was clear in my presentation, the line between art and documentary is very fuzzy. Um, and there are a lot of objects in the library that, you know, could sit very comfortably within the museum's collection and vice versa. And photography is unique and interesting in that way. Yes, thank you. So Katie, we have a few more questions. Kathy, you have a question and then Pete, and then uh, Marty has one that he put in the chat. Kathy. Hi, yeah. Hi Kathy. Oh, Katie, it's great to see you. And uh, thank you for that thoughtful and comprehensive overview of the collections. It's a, a massive amount of photography that you deal with. <laughs> um, yes. I was just wondering, I was curious about contemporary photography and how, as you mentioned, artists are often using photography in their work in interesting and challenging ways. How do you make decisions about where those pieces might be placed when when you accept them into the collection and and i assume there might be some really challenging um conservation issues related to some of these these pieces so you just kind of steer away from the ones that are challenging to go after them and try to deal with them i wondered if you, you could mean, just address that yeah sure sure you, you mean challenging from a conservation point of view yeah, and also I think challenging from a placement um, perspective. Placement um, in, in the collection. Store, you mean storage, storage wise? And in the collection, just where is it placed within the museum collection? Right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, hopefully at some point it would be placed in one of the galleries. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but would you classify it if an artist was working with photography and other materials? At what point? Is it not a photograph anymore? Oh, 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 oh I see, yeah. I see. Um, <laughs> I wasn't explaining it very well, sorry. No, 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 that's fine. And I, I didn't mean to be flippant there. I, I meant to um, also just make the point that um, there are so many photographs in the collection that are not on view. And of course, there are so many objects in every museum that are in storage at any given time. Um, but with photographs, this is uh, maybe we can say especially true because 
um, because they can only be out for um, a relatively short period of time, unlike painting or sculpture or other works of art that are much more stable. Photographs um, are light sensitive, as are other works on paper, but photographs even more so. Um, and because of this, we have to rotate them out of the galleries um, every four months or six months, um, or even less, depending on the process by which the photograph was made. Um, so you might come to the Johnson and see, you know, a photograph that you love on view and then come back just a couple weeks later and it's not there anymore. Um, so we do need to rotate these things out regularly. So ho hopefully, you know, the, the really great things in our collection will um, all see the light of day um, every few years, but we do always have to weigh the desire to share these with an audience um, with the desire to preserve them for future generations. Um, and then, yeah, your question about mixed media works. I mean, when it comes to um, when it comes to contemporary art, uh, a lot of artists are working across media, right? Um, they're interdisciplinary. Um, a lot of artists are not focused on just you know one medium alone. Um, and I'm very fortunate at the Johnson to have a wonderful colleague in our modern and contemporary curator, Andrea Inselman. And she and I always collaborate on our um, on our contemporary on our um, contemporary photographic works. Um, so I would never require anything uh, in the contemporary realm without consulting with her first. Um, and then she and I, you know, will will figure this out. You know, where where it should go, um, how it should be described, um, what the what the preservation needs of the object are. Um, but because photography is such an important part of the contemporary art world now, there is a huge overlap in those two areas. So she and I do work uh, do work really closely together um, a lot of times. Thank you. So, um, Marty, uh, would you like to ask your own question? Sure, I can do that. Um, I'm interested in um, discoverability of these images. Uh, you mentioned that it was there's difficulty in discovering photos without knowing the photographer, but in general, so how how can potential scholars um, find photographer photographs uh, within the collections, both the museum and the library? Right. Um, it's a great question. So within the museum, it's much more straightforward. The museum has a public facing uh, has a public facing database. Um, if you go to eMuseum, just the letter E followed by the word museum. Um, Dot cornell dot edu, um, you will find the museum's um, the museum's entire database, everything that is published. So this would exclude only things that have been very recently acquired that are not um, that do not officially belong to the museum yet. Sometimes it can take about a year um, from the time that things are acquired to the time that they are um, officially part of the museum's collection and therefore viewable on eMuseum. Um, but it has, you can search, um, you can search by artist, you can search by title, you can search by uh, kind of work, um, and there will be uh, thumbnail images available of almost everything. Um, so it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful resource. It's a fantastic way of finding things. You can also search by keyword. Um, so as long as there is good, um, as long as there is good subject cataloging for the works, you should be able to find things by searching for um, searching by keyword as well. Um, in the library, of course, things get more complicated. Um, so if you, you can search by, um, search by the photographer's name, search by the title, of, um, the title of the book, for instance, that you know contains photographs that you're interested in. Um, but you can also do things like um, do, an advanced, do an advanced search in the library catalog for the subject or the keyword that you're interested in, and then add another keyword, which would just be um, the word photograph um, with an asterisk next to it. And when you put the asterisk next to it, I'm sure most of you know um, that that will then encompass everything um, uh, that has the root word photograph in it. So it will include photographs, um, photography, photographies, um, if we're you know, speaking in French or um, anything, anything else. Um, and then you can you can search that way. So that way, things that um, contain the subject that you are looking for, as well as the word photograph in the catalog record somewhere will come up. Um, and you might come up with way too many things. And then what I would do is filter by library location. 
Um, so you're going to want to filter your search probably to Croc Library Rare and Manuscript Collections. Um, and that's when you will start to find really interesting things. Um, you can also search by you can also search by process, by photographic process. Um, however, in the library, cataloging has not typically focused very much on uh, photographic processes. So that's a little bit, um, that one may reveal some interesting things and may not. Um, you can also try searching by specific formats. So try searching by stereo card or cabinet card or carte de visite, um, things like that. But I think what I usually recommend is, you know, and I, I do tutorials on this sometimes with students where I bring up the library catalog page and do some examples with them. Um, but usually what I suggest is really just playing around with different combinations of search terms, limiting your library location to Croc Library and seeing what you come up with. So, so Katie, thank you. We're going to end very soon here. There's one a uh, couple more questions on the chat. I will just ask them and then we'll end by thanking you. Are there any particular photographers who had a strong connection to Cornell? And if so, are they represented in the collection? Then the second question will be, what could somebody come and see now or what exhibitions do you have planned? Sure. Um, so the first question is a great one. And yes, I can think of two people uh, right off the bat. The first is Liberty Hyde Bailey, um, who made those wonderful uh, botanical cyanotypes that we looked at earlier. Um, vast collection in RMC of his work, really beautiful things. Um, so those can be accessed in uh, the reading room at Croc Library. Um, and another one who was well known, Liberty Hyde Bailey may not be very well known to the world of photography, although, um, as Ann Kinney mentioned, he was, um, he was somebody who the very famous MoMA photo curator John Sarkowski was very interested in, um, but a photographer who um, all photo historians and students of, of photography would know is Margaret Bourke White, um, who uh, is a Corn was a Cornell alum didn't study photography here, but did start her photographic career here, taking pictures of campus buildings that she would sell um, to students to help finance her education. And she went on to become um, one of the most important photojournalists of the 20th century, um, including the first female staff photographer for Life magazine. Um, and the Johnson Museum holds hundreds of photographs by Margaret Brooke White. Um, and then exhibitions that are coming up. I mentioned that I'm teaching this class on photo books co-teaching this class on photo books. So um, I'm going to be um, organizing um, the exhibition that the students will create. They're going to uh, complete their plans for the exhibition at the end of the semester. And then I will be installing that in January uh, in the Johnson Museum. And then in January in the Hirschland Gallery of the Rare and Manuscript Collection, um, I'm very pleased to be co-curating with Brenda Marsden, who is the curator of human sexuality of the Human Sexuality Collection in RMC an exhibition on the lesbian, feminist, pro-sex, political magazine on our backs. Um, RMC has a complete run of the magazine as well as the archives of several photographers who were involved in that publication. Um, so that will open at the end of January, uh, soft opening at the end of January, and then um, we'll have our party in the middle of March, our, our official opening in the middle of March. Sounds wonderful, Katie. Thank you very much. Participants, please join me in virtual applause for <laughs> Katie's fabulous oh. presentation and question and answering. Hear, hear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. This is very fun. Thank you for the invitation and for being such a great audience.